hello, hello. Sorry, I'm just clearing out all my screens. Try to get myself in a position where there's not so much glare coming from my laptop screen, but I can't find it. So we're just gonna roll with where I'm at. Or maybe I'll wear my glasses like this. So that way when I do need to see, and then I'm talking, you can see my eyes. <laughs> All right, so we are picking up with week two, day four. Week two, day four of Be Still, tactic number two, submission. And last night, I um, had a technical issue that I learned to be prepared for, so I am prepared tonight my cell phone is fully charged, my laptop is fully charged, so I will not be speed talking my way through the end of Bible study so that I don't um, lose um, battery life. So I am prepared tonight. And uh, what I wanna do is I will actually pick up with where we left off. We were on worksheet, let's see. Worksheet number seven last night, we we went through, and question number four and question number five, I had to just kind of zip through. Um, so I will go back and recover and complete question number four and question number five on worksheet seven last night. And then we'll move on to worksheet number eight tonight. And so we're gonna continue with Philippians 4, 11 through 12. What I'm going to do is what I always do, which is to open up in prayer, and we are going to go ahead and jump right in. Alexa, stop. She gets going, and she just, the spirit hits her, and she just keep on going. I have to tell her to stop. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I just come before your throne right now, Lord, just giving you reverence, praise, glory, and honor. Lord, you are the great I am. You are the great physician. You are the great healer. You are the one who sits high and says, lo, I am with you always. So, Father, while we try to do things in and of our strength, Lord God, we know that we can look to you towards the hills from whence cometh our help. So, Lord God, even in times of weakness and times of distress, we know that you are the source of our strength and the hope and help of our calling, Father God. So right now, Lord God, I just completely surrender, submit, and yield myself to you so that, Lord God, I draw my strength from you. In the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, I thank you for the word that you will teach in clarity and efficiency with complete, precise understanding so that each and every ear and heart and mind that receives can understand and know what you have called and what you are saying and what you are speaking, Father God. Lord, I bind the hand and plan of Satan. I bind distractions. I bind any discord. I bind any misunderstanding and confusion of the word. For God, you say you are not the author of confusion. But you said, Lord God, that we can come and reason with you. And you said, Lord God, that even before we ask and as we are asking, you have given us the answer. So, Lord God, we seek you for answers in our heart and questions on our mind. We thank you, Lord God, that as we delight ourselves in you, you give us the desires of our heart, meaning you would plant desires there and give us the desire to fulfill them, Lord God. So draw us nigh unto you as you draw nigh unto us. Lord, I decrease that you might increase all of you and none of me in the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, I loose and release again, just your complete and total understanding. I loose and release, Lord God, the word to be powerful in its inner workings, Lord God, and I loose and release your wisdom and knowledge in Jesus name. You said that if any among us lack wisdom to let him ask of God who gives liberally and upbraideth not. So Father, right now we ask your wisdom. We ask your guidance and we ask your understanding. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, y'all, as usual, let's get to it. Hey, Gabby. Hey, Arthenia. Let's get to it. So last night I said I had to speed talk through four and five because I was not technologically prepared. 
prepared. I had my first technical issue with not charging my cell phone and putting my faith in iPhone that it would get me through and iPhone let me down. <laughs> so um, I am fully charged. The laptop is charged. The cell phone is charged. I think I have good lighting. Uh, the glare on my last glasses, we just, I don't know. We just, the word is more important than seeing me in my eyes. So we good. So worksheet number seven is where we left off last night. Question number four. And I guess, let me just do a recap for those that are just joining us or missed last night. What we talked about, hey dad, what we talked about was Philippians 4, 11 through 12. And it says, I am not saying this because I am in need for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. So we talked about the importance of learning to be content. We talked about what it meant to be content. And then we dug a little deeper and went a little bit further in the study about the fact that contentment is a learned process. It says, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And I think that is such an on-time scripture for everything that we are enduring right now with the global impact, this pandemic, pandemic of COVID-19. A lot of us are learning to be content and our situations. And then there's a lot of us that are struggling through that. And I mean, I get it. I, I really was thinking on the aspect. Um, there's so many things that you think about, like, you know, once you we through kind of what you're going through and what you're enduring, and then you start to look at your surroundings and the impact that it has on your neighbors and your loved ones and your family and your friends, and then the world as a whole, um, you start to just think on, you start to dissect and think on the different issues. So schools are closed. So then that means children are not in school. And that means that some kids are not graduating or getting to walk across that stage. Or um, then you go on a bigger scope, you know, that means children are home and you have some children that are in households that they're abused. And now they're at home with their abusers daily. So that's something that you think about. And then, um, you know, you think about, isolation and we're going on you know places or I have a cousin who lives in Spain you know they've been on lockdown for weeks now and you know they can't leave their home they can't you know go out except for essentials and things like that and then you think about people that um they don't do well in isolate people that suffer from depression or um just have that need to be around other people so there's so many different aspects of Things that are impacting and affecting people so differently. The mental and emotional state of the world is just kind of upside down right now. So I think I shared this last week and I just said, I was just asking God, you know, God, there's so much. How do you pray? And I watched a video of a nurse today and uh, she is in the midst of all of this. And she's, she said, you know, in all honesty, I, I, I want to quit. I want to walk away. But then she went a little deeper and she talked about how the fact that this virus isolates people. Once people are diagnosed with it, that's it. They have to be isolated. You know, it's not even a hospital stay where family and friends can come see them and sit with them and encourage them and pray. they are alone. And she was saying that you know, she realizes that God called her for such a time as this and that God placed her in this industry for something like this. And she realizes she really is the only person that's there for some of those people. And she's just seen death on a daily. And so it's just the larger scope of things impacting us. And so when we talk about circumstances and the Apostle Paul wrote, you know, that he's learned to be content in whatever the circumstances. And then he goes on to say, I have learned the secret of being content. And we talked about the secret last night. And we talked about how it referenced, we went back to our um, foundation scripture, which is Philippians 4, Philippians 4 and 6, and it says that we are to not be anxious. Let me read it to you. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, my prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Number seven, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds with Christ Jesus. So Paul is teaching us that 
He's learned to be content in every situation and every circumstance because he recognizes that it's the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Well, what do you mean by surpasses all understanding? Well, surpasses means it just goes beyond completely, just blows everything else out the water. Um our, our natural minds, how we comprehend or we rationalize or we reason things and we say, you know, well, this is a situation that I'm enduring or I'm dealing with. But the peace of God says it does not matter what you're dealing with or enduring. You rest in my peace. And so last night we talked about Jesus being joy and we referenced some scriptures there. And so I'm just recapping and bringing back to where we ended up last night. Just talking about learning what it means to be content. And so we talked about last night, questions one through three, we talked about what does it mean to me to be content? What are some of the circumstances I am facing? And I shared, you know, my personal situation. I shared my personal testimony about the whole housing situation and then God's provision. And then number three, what are some areas of need that I am lacking in? And I do believe I touched on that last night. Philippians. Yeah, I did. We just talked about that Four, eleven through 12. We did touch on that. We left with four and five and four. We picked up with what are some areas of abundance that I do have? So we asked, what are you lacking? And then now we're talking about what are some areas of abundance that I do have? And for me, immediately what the Holy Spirit gave me and took my mind to was third John one and two. So let's turn to that third John one and two. What are some areas that I am um, that I do have abundance? Third John one and two is where we are going. And again, for all those that are just joining us, our recap, the workbook is in the bio, the link download, because if you're wondering what am I teaching from or what am I talking about? I'm talking about the workbook. Be still a seven week, seven tactical devotional um, that is step by step. And then I am doing the devotional along with everyone because God is literally giving me this day by day as we go. Um, well, let me take that back. He gave it to me in two days in the form of my prayer and devotional time and just notes upon notes upon notes. And then as far as me putting it together in workbook, I am working on that day by day. But I am giving you my personal devotion. I'm sharing. These are not answers. When I give these to you, these are not answers to complete in the workbook because it should be your study and your personal growth and devotional time. But I am sharing um, how God deals with me so that it can encourage you. All right. So third John one and two. So my answer to to Kia, what are some areas of abundance that I do have? And I shared, I touched on that a little bit the night before on day two, is that I said immediately what came to mind for me that I have an abundance of is um, an outpouring of love, a community, a village, a tribe. I I have, that's one of the things that I realize and recognize that I am just completely blessed to have so many people in my life that care about me. And I'm not just talking about friends and family. I, I'm, I mean, just in every aspect of whatever God has given me, um, in business and in, uh, the workplace and, um, in church and ministry, just in anything. I I have had to recognize that I am just extremely blessed to have so much love and support. And why that is important to me is because the enemy um, genuinely, truly tried to and probably will continue to try to attack me in my mind and my thought process to tell me that I am alone, to isolate me and to inundate me with thoughts of helplessness and hopelessness and nobody cares and woe is me and I don't have this, I don't have that and I don't, you know, and one of those areas that really for me, I said, heal her was born out of coming to the knowledge of God showing me like, Hey girl, wake up. You have people heal her was born out of that because I had major surgery last year. And my, my own personal plan when I had surgery was I'm going to have surgery and I'm going to go home. And my son, you know, who was 15 at the time, 
he knows how to cook. He knows how to clean. You know, I, I he can do those little things for me and I'll just relax. And I, the surgery I had, let's see, recovery was, they told me it was going to be out for about three months. And really that surgery, whew, that knocked me on my butt. It was, I, I'm still kind of recovering from it. I still get certain pains from it. So it's quite interesting, the body, how it can, how long it can take to heal. But anyway, they told me I was going to be out six to eight weeks and it ended up being like three months. And my thought process was, you know, I'll be fine. I'll go home and I will take care of myself. And where I fall short, then my son, hey, Jen, my son will... um Awesome. Proud of you. <laughs> good, good. Thou good and faithful servant. You showed up. You're late to class, but you're here. <laughs> That's all that count matters. So um, what was I saying? So I had the surgery and my thought process was I was just going to take care of myself. And right off the top, I had a very dear friend of mine. Several of them actually were like, uh, yeah, no, you won't. What you're going to do is I will get you to the hospital and we will be there at the hospital with you and we will pick you up from the hospital when they uh, discharge you and you will not go home. You will come to my house and you will stay at my house for the next six weeks. And, you know, I, I think even in that, I still hadn't my mind hadn't wrapped around the fact that you're about to have major surgery. This is not something that somebody goes through on their own. And that's just how I was conditioned. I was conditioned to deal with things on my own, even to the point of you have a major surgery where they are literally about to open your body up and stitch you back together. And um, so getting back to the the abundance, what I feel I have an abundance of was people showed up for me. I didn't want for a thing. And, and, you know, friends took care of my son and made sure he got to school. And, uh, you know, I call her my sister. She's my sister. She took care of me. We're, we're not blood. We're not alike at all. We're not even the same skin tone. But my sister was the one that was like, you're going to come with me. And she brought me into her home and she cooked me three meals a day and she my other sister took care of my son and then I had someone that took care of the business like I literally had to do nothing and it was that realization for me that I really had an abundance of support and people and I mean I didn't even make this a public thing but as it began to be a trickle and people started to find out I had people that I had not even seen or heard from in years find me and reach out and come see me and make meals and bring things for me and, you know, ask how I was doing and check. And it just was a reality check uh, for me that I have people and it's only snowballed from there. And so I am learning to um, cherish that and to value those relationships and those friendships. And, you know, um, so third John one and two, this scripture is what immediately the Holy Spirit gave me that says, or I'm sorry, third John one. Yeah, yeah, one and two. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. And so the word that stood out for me is soul. So let me explain that when where it goes to how it correlates to abundance for me for a soul. So we talked about our spirit when we need thing, we, our spirit, we talked about this the other day that we are a spirit. God says in Genesis and he says, let us make man in our image. Well, God is, God is a spirit. So if God created us. He created us as spirits. We are made in his image. And then he formed man from the dust of the earth, also in Genesis. And he gave us this body. And so that's why when, you know, when people pass on and they go on and their the body begins to decay, it starts to turn back to dust. And so, but then we also have a soul. We are a spirit that has a body that lives in a body and we have a soul. And our soul is the center of our thoughts, our emotions, our will, our intellect, our feelings. And so our soul is what, Third John one and two says, he says, you know, I know that you have the spirit. I know that your spirit 
is going to prosper because your spirit was created in the image of God, the father, the son, and the Holy spirit. Um, John tells us that he says that I will not leave you comfortless, but I will send you the spirit. I will give you my spirit. Jesus, we covered that last night. Also, he says, my peace, I give you my peace. I leave you. We have the spirit of God, the father, the son, and the Holy spirit. Those things never hurt. They never go without. They are never misled. They are never alone or feeling lonely. But third John says, I wish above all things that your soul may prosper. So God is concerned about our soul. Again, thought, will, intellect, emotions, how we're feeling. Um, Scripture also tells us, it says that we have a high priest who is touched with the feelings of our infirmity. And it's talking about Jesus and the fact that Jesus never ceases to stop praying for us. So if he says he's touched with the feelings of our infirmities, Jesus also feels and God gave us feelings and emotions. And we've talked about this plenty of times as believers. You know, we had, I had this conversation with my sister earlier and she said, someone talked to her about having faith over fear in reference to a certain situation. And I said, yes, we do have to have faith over fear. However, we have to also use wisdom because a lot of times um, we can allow our faith I'm so strong in faith. I trust and I stand. I believe in God that sometimes we step out there in things that are foolish that God did not tell us to. And we have to use wisdom. So we were having that conversation. And um, where was I going with that, Lord? (laughs) Y'all just completely lost my train of thought. So we're talking about having faith over fear and we're talking about our soul prosper. And that's it. Holy Spirit. Thank you. And uh, so God, it is okay for us to have emotions and feelings about a thing. It is okay for us to cry. It is okay for us to get upset. It is okay for us to get angry. It is okay for us to hurt. It is okay for us to, the Bible even says that he says, do not let the sun go down on your wrath, meaning don't let the sun set and you're mad. So he's like, You have feelings. You're going to have things that prompt you and you're mad, but I don't want you to live in there. Don't stay in that. So our spirit does not go through those emotions like our soul does. And so God says, I care about your soul also. I care that I made you. You're human. I created you. I care about your soul and I want your soul to prosper. So for me, 3 John 1 and 2 was the scripture that came to mind when I thought about having an abundance, what I have an abundance of, and that is an abundance of love and people that support me. God cares about my soul. That's the soul thing. God cares that my soul prospers. He cares that I am able to be poured into by other individuals and vice versa, that I can pour into other individuals because I care about their soul and their thought, emotions, will, and intellect. He cares about relationship. God is a God of relationship. He is not a God of religion. He is a God of order, but he is not a God of religion. He is a God of relationship. And so for For number four, abundance was something that I personally feel I have plenty of, and I am so grateful for it. And I'm so blessed so much for the better for it. And um, having that village has pulled me out of some really, 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 really dark times and some pretty dark stuff. And God is good. Number five, um, what do... What does any and every area of contentment look like to me? So let's go back real quick to last night. And I'll tell you what content means. Said a peaceful state of happiness. That is what the Webster's Dictionary defines content as. A peaceful state of happiness. But I circled happiness because happiness is an emotion. It is from our soul. And God, we talked about Philippians 4 and 6 that says the peace of God that passes. Wait a minute. Is that right? Yes. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And we talked about happiness is not the way that we measure our spiritual walk. Joy is. Happiness is a state of happiness is a state of an emotion. Joy is a state of being. It absolutely is and it absolutely comes from Jesus. So when we talk about contentment, what I wrote is 
I feel that I have complete contentment to me is that I have complete, total, unwavering, assured and confident trust in God. And it is all due to the inner joy in Christ that I have. Happiness can be given and it can be taken. Happiness can come from a source of things and it can be taken from a source of things. Jesus, your joy, the way, the truth and the life, the one who was and is and is to come. He's there. He's a constant. He is the source of your joy. And so number five, what does any and every area of contentment look like to me? I went back to scripture. Philippians 4.13 is where we're going. And Philippians 4.13 says... I know what it says, but I'm just trying to find it here in the NIV. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I summed up what contentment looks like to me in that scripture. I can do all things through him who gives me strength, which is Christ Jesus. Jesus is the source of my strength. Jesus is the source of my joy. Jesus is the source of my help, my hope, everything. And so when we... Go back to, I'm not going to get into it again because I don't want to, um, you have to catch um, day three last night, but I testified about it. One of the questions was two things that we are facing and I named my housing situation and provision. And I testified about how God, even in the midst of a world meltdown and even in the midst of what started a couple of months ago that I thought was just, this is just another thorn in my side was God working out all good, all, all working all good out for me. He works all things out for my good and so learning and this is what I touched on this is what I want to wrap that up in is what contentment looks like to me is Jesus Christ and we talked about um it says Philippians 4 and 7 and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus so contentment to me means I stay in Christ Jesus and in means to be encompassed or surrounded by so I have to stay in Christ Jesus and as I stay in Christ Jesus then I learn that I don't have to do things in and of myself because if I am in him that means he's in me he's around me he's covering me he keeps me and it says that I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And so when I seek my strength from him, my source, then I begin to grab hold of the knowledge that I don't have to do things in and of myself. He is the one that I go to for my strength. He is the one that I go to for my help. He is the one that I go to for my peace because I'm in him. Okay, if you think about something, what's a good example, Holy Spirit? If you think about, let's just say a bubble. If you think about a bubble and something, it now a bubble's not a good example. It's a good visual, but it's not a bubble. If you pop it, it's gone. Um, but okay. All right. So I'm going to give a prison cell. That's all I heard is a prison cell, a tank. There you go. Thank you, Holy Spirit. So if you think of a tank out on a battlefield, that's perfect because we are talking, talking about this is a war and we are learning how to war spiritually. So if you think about a tank and all of us have seen a tank, whether in, you know, in real life, in real time or in movies or what have you, a tank is this solid, well-built, so many tons of something. And it is built for a certain terrain and to endure certain things. It is just pretty much indestructible, I would imagine. Um, and when you put those individuals inside of that tank, they know that they are surrounded by all of this metal and this heavy artillery and this equipment that is going to protect them. So when I say that I am in Christ Jesus, if you have the visual of yourself being inside of a tank and the mindset of what a tank does for someone going out on the battlefield, when I'm In Christ Jesus, everything in him, he is my protection. He is covering me. He is keeping me. He is guarding me. Even when I am going through whatever the battle is, that is why he's there for me. So if you think of it like that, when I say I am content, 
My contentment comes from the fact that I know that I am in Christ Jesus. I am protected by him. I am covered by him and he is going to be the source of my strength. So that for me, number um, five, what does any and every area of contentment look like to me? It just means that I draw my strength from Jesus, no matter what I'm going through, no matter the circumstances that I am facing, no matter what is to come, no matter what happened in the past, my strength. And that means when I say I can draw my strength from him again, that tells me I don't have to walk in my own strength in this. I can rest in him. Bible says there is a rest for the people of God. I can rest in him. I can cast my cares on him. We talked about that several times. What it means to cast, it means to throw with great force. And he says, cast your cares upon me because I care for you. He says, throw it with great force, throw it down. And so let's touch on the learning part of that again, because again, someone said to me, you know, Takiya, I just don't know how to, I, I love God. I know God. I trust him. I have faith in him, but I just don't know how to trust him or get provision from him. So you can insert whatever area that is. It might not be provision from you. It might be faith. It might be healing. It might, whatever. It says it's learn. Paul, the apostle Paul in Philippians 4, 11 through 12 said, I have learned. He didn't say I just automatically got it. He said, I've learned it. And so let's touch on that because last night, what I talked about when I gave my testimony was I talked about the frustration of constantly being shuffled around like we get in a house and this is going to be it and we're going to stay here and I decorate and I make it home and I'm like oh god this is great and then some uncanny crazy left field circumstance says dictates otherwise and says nope you have to move and then we move and we get in there and we do the same thing this is great. This is home. I'm going to make it home. I'm going to you know make this house a home and we're going to stay here and we're not going anywhere and then something happens. And so the thing that I that I touched on with that is after a while, I had to learn, learn that God was in the details. He was the one that was shifting me from one place to the next, because every time he moved us, there was purpose. Every time he opened up a door to place us somewhere, he took care of us. He made sure that everything we needed was provided for. He always allowed me to turn the house into a home, even if it was just for a short amount of time or for the circumstances. And every time I was there, it always turned out to be for my surroundings. My neighbor, maybe I had a neighbor who was enduring a battle with their health and I was sent to pray for them. Or maybe I had a neighbor who was going through a bad divorce and grew up in church, but was angry with Jesus Christ and had withdrawn. And I was there to remind them that Jesus is still Lord. God still loves you. Or there was always purpose. And I began to recognize and realize, do I, was it frustrating? Yes. But I began to recognize and realize that this is God's God ordering my steps. He said the steps of a righteous man are ordered. And so what he was doing was putting me in places that he needed me to be to show people that Jesus was still alive in the earth or for whatever reason, he always took care of us. But every time the purpose was completed, time's up. It's time to move on. And so what I had to learn in that was to be content, whatever the circumstances, be content because I pray and say daily, my life is yours, God, your will, not mine, whatever you have me to do, wherever you tell me to go, I'll go. And he was like, oh, okay, well, I have a willing, surrendered and submitted soul here who says she'll be obedient to what I need her to do. She says her life is not her own, that I can use her for my glory. Well, then let me start doing that. And so I had to learn, number one, that the words that I spoke, God took them seriously. And also learning is it's a process learning to trust God. And I said this last night that oftentimes we as believers, we as human beings, we don't want to go through anything. We want the easy route. We don't want to fight. We just want things handed to us. And sometimes we'll work for it for a little bit. 
But then when the fire gets turned up in the furnace just a little too hot, we're like, never mind. Let me just back away. Talked about it last night. It said Peter walked on water in the midst of the storm. Peter saw Jesus walking on the water and he said, Lord, if it be you bid me come on the water. And Jesus said, come on. You said you want to come on the water. You said you want to do what I'm doing. Come on. And then Peter got out there and then he got upset because of the storm and understand the storm represents it is representative, figuratively speaking, of whatever you may be enduring in your life, whatever you're going through. You telling God, I love you. I serve you. I live for you. You're telling him I'm ready to walk on water. And then he says, well, come on. Let's walk on water. Let's do some things in this earth's realm that people haven't seen done. And you get out that boat and then your storm comes. You know, you get hit with losing your job and now you don't have no money. You get hit with, you know, now I have no money. And so how am I going to pay my mortgage? And I'm about to lose the house. You get hit with, you know, there I'm my, somebody in the family is dealing with illness in their body or sickness in their body. And I, I wasn't dealing with all this stuff until I started, you know, telling God that I want to live for him. But maybe this is not God. This is this is hard. Maybe, you know, that storm starts to whirl and swirl around you. And then we get like Peter and we get distracted and disturbed and fearful. And then we start sinking. And the way that you learn to be content is you have to keep on walking no matter what the storm is. Because the one who says come, who brought you to it, is obligated to bring you through it when you put your trust in him. And as he brings you through it, as you push through and you say, you know what? It does not matter. I am living for Jesus. I am serving him. He is my provider. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is going to make sure that my finances are covered, that this house is taken care of. And guess what? Even if he doesn't, if I lose it and I have to move or if he shifts me somewhere else, I am going to trust that he's going to take me. He's going to take care of me. And in that process of trusting to be content in the circumstances, trusting to be content in any and every situation, then you increase your faith because Jesus is not going to let you down and keep going to numbers 23 and 19. God is not a man that he would lie. Neither the son of man that he would repent. Has he not said it? Shall he not do it? He will do what he said he will do according to his will and according to his word. And so it will increase your faith when you go through the storm, and you see Jesus bring you across the water, it increases your faith. And now you've learned to trust in him. So contentment is a learned process. And you cannot, as a believer, be afraid to learn, which means by going through the adversity. That is how you build your trust. And that is how you build your faith. And level after level, that is how you get stronger and stronger in Christ. Because the more he does it for you, you begin to get to the place where you go, well, you know what? He did it for me last time. Let's try it out again. Oh, he did it again. Okay, let's see if he does it again. Oh, he did it again and again and again. And then you get to the place where you're like, you know what? He's going to do it no matter what every time. Because again, Isaiah 55 and 11, so shall his word be that goes out of his mouth. It shall not return void, but it shall prosper in the very thing whereto he sent it. And remember, we said you are the thing that he sent his word to. You are the thing that he wants to prosper in. You are the thing that he will perform a great work in. So contentment is a learned process. You have to learn it and you cannot learn it unless you go through it. So suit up warriors, understand adversity will come, but you have to have peace in God. He has to be the source of your strength and you have to walk through this thing. You have to walk it out because you can sink and get back in the boat. But you'll never know what's on the other side if you do. Let him take you to the other side. So that was number five for me. I can do all. And I circled all because all is encompassing. It is everything. It leaves nothing out. I can do all things through Christ who is my strength. So that was actually the... Um, that was the so last night, like I said, I ran out of my battery was dying and I had to speed talk my way through and I wanted to come back and recap worksheet number seven. 
And so now we're going to move on to worksheet number eight, which our supporting scriptures are Philippians, where this is completely all out of Philippians. Philippians 4 through 6. Let's read that. Philippians 4 through 6 says, and actually this is our, Philippians 4 through 6 is actually our foundation scripture. This is the scripture that um, we started out with. So in this workbook you have, a, no I'm sorry, you have, well theme, foundation. You have a theme scripture, which is your foundation scripture. And then you have supporting scripture. And then you have your affirming scripture at the end. So for Philippians 4 and 6 is actually our theme, which are, it's theme scripture. And so we went through and we went on day one and we dissected that and tore it apart and got the meaning and understanding and clarity of it all. And now we're going to dig deeper in it with some exercises. Philippians 4 and 6 says, and then again, I'm reading from the NIV Bible. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation in prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. All right. So. The next three exercises, we are going to tear down, dissect again. There are three steps that talks about, we're talking about submitting, which talks, which means to give. When we submit to God, what are we submitting? What is he asking? What are we telling him we're going to submit? So for instance, one scripture that I touched on earlier this week is, uh, wives, submit yourself, therefore, unto your, su wives, submit your selves to your husbands and a lot of times you hear women they just want to throw in the towel they're like mm -mm, I'm not submitting that don't sound right and basically when you think about the word submit it means to give but what are you giving what is God asking you to give you know your time your love your support your energy submit is not a cuss word and so we have been talking about how when we submit and how we give or when we yield to, we are giving to God and we are giving what he's asking of us. And so Philippians 4, 6, and this one, what we're going to focus on is by prayer. So this is one step in the tactic of submission that we give to God. He says by prayer. So in your workbook, it's bold and it's italicized. And it says, prayer should... And needs to be a perpetual part of my daily coming and going. Talking to God about any and everything helps me to submit my thoughts, actions, and plans to him. I will write down all the areas I want to submit and give to God. Then I will pray or talk to him about them anytime I try to do these things on my own. And we want to talk to God because we're learning to submit. We learned that last week surrender means to cease to resist that we are going to stop fighting God on certain things and now we are learning to submit we are going to give those things that we fight God with or that we stop fighting God with we're going to give those things to him and so it says I'm going to write down the things that I want to talk to God about the things that are obstacles the things that I'm trying to do in and of myself the things that I try to take on the things that keep rising up whatever it could be a million and one things it can be one thing on there and it says anytime I am trying to do these things on my own I'm going to talk to God because that is how we're going to learn to submit we're going to you know what I am okay I just you know I, I talked about this workbook this whole devotional I had uh a disagreement <laughs> someone I know used to say a heat what do you say uh, um, a heated debate or something like that a heated discussion which basically means an argument and with and, and so we had this this disagreement and it just went completely left field and left me in a place of hearing God say be still and I was just like you know God what in the world do you mean what are you talking about and that was born out of this and so that is an area of my communication with this individual that we constantly are just butting heads and God is like I just want you to be still and wrapped up in that are these steps and so anytime I find myself trying to handle things myself well maybe I should call and we should talk about this or maybe we should get together and we should do this or maybe I should say this or maybe if you watched the other day I said I wasn't calling ever never 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 ever again and in the middle of my worship God said call him <laughs> that was submission no that was surrender that was ceasing to resist and so anytime we find ourselves 
trying to do things in and of ourselves, we are going to submit to God. We are going to give it to God. We are going to go, you know what? No, I'm not going to handle it the way I would normally handle it. I cease to resist. I yield to God and I'm going to give it to him. So these are the things that I wrote down and it's a free write area on your workbook. And I'm just going to go into, I'm not going to go into detail about what each thing means to me, but I'm just going to tell you some of the things that I wrote down that I'm constantly submitting and giving to God. And then what God gave me was he gave me scriptures, one, two, three, four, five specific scriptures about where we see the word pray and how important it is to pray. So what I wrote was number one, I wrote, I, again, we're studying. And so I like to look at what words mean pray. When I looked in the Bible, or when I looked in, um, when I looked it up to define it, prayer to pray is defined as a solemn request for help or expression of thanks addressed to God. Now, what stood out to me, request for help or expression of thanks addressed to God. That sounds good. But then when I, the word solemn just stood out to me because when I hear the word solemn, that makes me think of very, um, I don't want to use the definition that it gave me because I'm going to tell you what that is. But when I thought of solemn, that made me think of a mood like, you know, like a whole mood, (laughs) like just be quiet in a box, you know, just not mournful, but just what is the word? I'm trying to give my own personal definition of it without telling you what the actual definition is. But when I heard solemn, it just made me think sad, just not even sad, but just. We'll just go with sad. So that word didn't settle well with me when it said request for help or expression of thanks addressed to God, because I'm like, I'm not always solemn when I go to God. You know, I mean, there are times when I'm just like completely devoutly just, you know, I can't even think of the word that I want to use other than just sad keeps coming up. And I know that's not what it means, but just it's not always solemn. You know, you, you. We talk about this being a relationship and in a relationship, it's going to be a diverse and wide scope of ways that you're going to go to God. It's not going to always be solemn. I guess what that makes me think of is it tells me that prayer has a format and that it's supposed to be a certain way. And yes, there is. And when we get into prayer in that tactical There is a way that God wants us to come to him, but we talk about praying and just talking to him. There is no, you know, format that or religious doctrine that you just have to just, okay, put that down. And let me tell you, there's a scripture we'll talk about that. I'm going to get ahead of myself because I want to address that because the Holy Spirit said, yes, absolutely. Give them this scripture. So when I looked up the definition of solemn, it said formal and dignified. And those words, I was just like, eh you know, dignified, you know, we, we, God says, come to him as we are. And so for us to come dignified or solemn, you know, I'm, you come to him in a relationship and you be who he created you to be. You, you have to be transparent with God. You have to be, um, you have to be who he, you have to be comfortable with him. He knows who you are. And so, but then the other side of that, it, I did a little further study and it said sincere, earnest, and honest. So that part I like, but just when I saw formal and dignified and solemn, I was like, yeah, no, no, that you, you go to God in the way that your heart is pulling you to go to God because he knows who you are and how you are. And let's talk about that. Let me go to that scripture first. Um, do, 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 do. Where is it, Lord? Matthew 6 and 9. So this explains it a little better to you. Matthew 6 and 9. Because Jesus even addressed this. He was like, when you come to pray, this is what I expect of you. So he says, first, let's back, let's back up. There's two scriptures. Let's back up to Matthew 6. And six, he says, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. So he says, pray two times. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is seen. And then he talks about, you know, your father in heaven, when you pray, 
in secret. He'll reward you openly, but drop down. And then he even says a prayer. We, we covered this the other day. He says, this is how you can pray. But then go down to eight. Do not be like them. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Nope. Let me back up. Okay. Let me read the whole thing. Matthew six and six and I'll go down. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees, sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, here we go. Seven. So we go back to solemn and why that just did not settle with my spirit. Like solemn, you know, there's a rule and methods and you got to go to God. Just, mm, you know, uh, no, that's not how I, I mean, I'm sorry. That's not how I go to God. I mean, there's times where it is a complete reverence, but it was just, it just didn't sound right. And so God said, yep, go here. No, Matthew six and seven. And when you pray, do not Keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. So what he's saying is not necessarily talking about Solomon, but he's saying when you get before me, when you come to me, we keep on saying that prayer, you just equate it to talking. God is like, you don't have to come to me with all this eloquence. You don't have to come to me piecing all these words together. You don't have to burn candles and incense and, you know, slaughter a lamb and sacrifice it on the altar. Just come to me, please. You know, just, just come to me. And so he doesn't want all these religious acts. He doesn't want that. He wants your relationship with him. And so that scripture stood out to me. And everyone that I read, I want you to circle the word pray in your Bible. If you have a Bible that you are studying and is okay and not like a sin to God to write in your Bible, <laughs> circle the word pray. And then let's go to, oh, let me back up. So I'm getting ahead of myself. So I did not tell you all what I pray for, what some of the things I wrote. So I wrote my children, my family. These are the things that I constantly have to submit, have to give to God, because if I don't, then Takiya will try to fix it all and do it and piece it together and do, and then it just is a mess. And so I constantly have to just submit, give to God, my children, my family, my comings and my goings. And what I mean by that is, you know, God, what do you want me to do today? Where am I supposed? Is it okay to go here? I travel uh, until COVID happened. I, I love to travel. Absolutely love it. It is my escape. It is my getaway. It is my therapy. There is actually a word that's called that, that, for people that travel, I forget the name of it escapes me. It's on my Instagram page. I posted it, but I love to travel. And my absolute favorite place to travel right now is the Caribbean. Started traveling to the Caribbean. I think the first time I went to the Bahamas was back in like 2017, 2016, something like that. And ever since I have been traveling to a different island in the Bahamas, Dominican Republic, um, St. Lucia, just different islands, just checking out the Caribbean because I absolutely love it. And again, I said, if it be God's, my plan is to retire in the Caribbean. I don't know what God feels about that, but that is my plan. And so when I travel or when I want to go somewhere, I learn to get in the habit of asking God if it's okay. You might think, well, Takiya, you work hard, you know, the kid, you know, Jay's out of school, so he has time to go with you or you have the finances or whatever. Circumstances dictate that, yeah, you can travel. But I have learned and I'm still learning to ask God, is it okay to go? Because let me give you a case in point. April, what is today? April 4th or 5th? April 12th, I was supposed to be, I had booked a flight for my son and I to go to St. Lucia, to the Caribbean, to go visit some family. And well, they become my engrafted family. And I booked a flight. I booked a flight about two months ago. And I remember <laughs> I booked it and then I asked. And I was like, well, it's already booked. So, and you know, we try to be slick with God. We try to slip. Well, you know, I already paid for it. And so, you know, so I booked it and then I asked. And what happens before we even got to COVID and all this stuff spiraling, I felt in my spirit, this is not the time to go. But I still, I found some 
tickets that were just you could not pass it up and I was like I'm gonna go and I just the next couple of days it just did not sit well in my spirit and I knew that was God he was like you ain't asked me you're not supposed to go you go ahead and go if you want to go ahead go on out there but he just kept prompting me and finally I asked God can I go I didn't pay for tickets. I didn't book Airbnb. I didn't block the calendar. I didn't pack my bags two months in advance. God, can I go? No. <laughs> I got to know before I got it all out. And so what did I end? What ended up happening? I lost some money because the airline, because the flight was so um, inexpensive. And this was again before everything started shutting down. It was like you had this cancellation fee or what have you and I lost some money. But then look at God. Where are we at right now? Would I be able to travel? If I could travel, what would I be subjecting myself to? So I am learning and that's next week, I was supposed to be hopping a flight next week. So I have learned am learning to ask God permission. Yes. Do we ask God permission? Absolutely. He's our daddy. I ain't grown to him. He don't care. Nothing about my whole 43 years on this earth. I am his child and he is my daddy and he wants me to ask permission. So I am praying to, I am learning to submit and ask him when and where can I go? Because if it were up to me, <laughs> I just come and go as I feel like it. Um, finances, provision and purpose. That is something I constantly submit to him and give to him. My relationships. Matters of the heart, as well as friends and family, business and associations. Another thing that I always submit and surrender, su submit to him, I have friendships. I pray about friendships. God, this person has come into my life. Is there purpose? Are they supposed to be in my life? Is it okay for me to hang out with them? What do you want me to do in reference to this? Because everybody ain't always for you. We just leave it at that right there. <laughs> and so I learned to submit to God and I learned to yield to that discernment as well. Um, I pray about health. Here's something specific. What I can and can't eat. God had me fasting meat at one point in time. And I know when it's God because it is just like whenever he tells me there's something I can and can't do, my spirit, there is an absolute. Um, he doesn't allow me to. I'm, I'm unsettled. He does not allow me to rest in that. If it is not something, you know, that he wants me to do, someplace he wants me to go, to go, um, or something to eat. I just, I'm either unsettled about it. And when I finally obey him, it's effortless. There's no fight. I know when God is calling me to fast because I can fast for 21 days. No problem. When I try to do it on my own, I can't make it 21 minutes. I kid you not, if I'm like, oh, I'm just going to fast today and there's nothing wrong with purposing to fast on your own. It's good. It's self-discipline, but fasting has its purposes. And when God calls me to fast, I'm telling you, it is effortless. I'm like, food, what is that? I'm good. When I wake up and, and usually when I decide that I want to fast on my own, there's an underlying there. I'm like, I'm going to fast, but I think I want to drop a little bit of weight. That is not what fasting is for. Come on. I ain't the only one who lives there. Don't judge me. So when, when it's God, it is effortless though. I have absolutely zero problem doing it. But when it's in and of myself, it is a struggle. Another thing that I submit and I wrote on my prayer list is my surroundings and the world, what is going on in the world. I'm constantly praying for people in the world and our healthcare workers and souls. I have souls. I'm constantly praying, you know, God, use me as a laborer in the vineyard. Word of God says the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. It's talking about there's an abundance of souls out there that do not know Jesus Christ. And it says the laborers, the people of God are few. People are sitting back like, well, I got my salvation. I'm good. Me and my three, we good. We in. No, I pray and I ask God submit. Even when I travel, when he does allow me to travel, I'm like, okay, God, I'm here. You allowed me to come here. Who we getting saved? I'm always asking God. I'm always submitting. And so those are the seven. That number seven just keeps popping up. And as y'all know, seven is the Lord's number of um, 
completion. And so, and, and I was going to write a whole, he said, stop, you know, he's like, these are the things I want you to cover. And these are the one, two, three, four, five. Okay. It's only five scriptures and get all deep. So those are the things on my prayer list. And so then let's go to Matthew six. What well, we just read Matthew six and six. That was one of the ones we covered because what I wanted you just to focus on was pray how important it is to pray. If it talks about, if it talks about anything in the Bible, then God wants you to do it. He didn't just put it there just as a prayer, just um, because it looked pretty on paper. He put it in there for a reason and a purpose. And we're talking about pray. And so we're getting these examples of prayer. So that is where Jesus, Matthew 6 and 6, he says, go into your, pro- when you enter in your closet to pray, you pray to him in secret and he'll reward you openly. What does that mean? That means when you have a prayer life, when you're talking to God and you're believing in God for something and you are committed and dedicated to that, he's not telling you, you know, to get out there with a megaphone or just tell everybody, you know, just to be bragging about it or boastful about it. But he wants you to have a secret place in the yes <laughs> I was about to say in the name of Jesus I'm I'm talking but I seen somebody's comment and I was adding to it but um he, he wants you to meet him. Psalms 91 says he who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty. If you are not reading Psalms 91 daily or speaking that I urge you to do it, especially with what is going on right now. It talks about God being your protection, your covering. It talks about God keeping plague and terror from your dwelling. It talks about a thousand falling at your side and 10,000 at your right, but not coming near you. Read Psalms 91 daily, speak it, confess it, pray it, share it with everyone you know. But he says that he is our secret place. And so he says, when you commune with him, when you relationship with him, when you reason with him, when you talk with him, when you are building that rapport with him, he wants to show you off. He wants to show you off that, hey, you know, this, this, this is good. This is my girl. This is, she spends time with me and I'm going to take care of her and I'm going to reward her openly because I am a God that is open because I don't know why I was struggling with the scripture last week, but it was let your light so shine that men may see your good works and glorify God, your father in heaven. So he says, you do the good works. Let your light shine. And the light that shines is the light of Christ Jesus that's in us. He says, let your light shine. That men may see your good works. So we have a role in that. We have to do the good works. But he says, but then will men will glorify God, our father who is in heaven. And remember, we talked about that all glory. It always comes back to him. No matter what comes of the situation, it is always for glory of the father. And so Matthew six and six talked about praying. And then Matthew six and nine, Jesus said, you know, it's not about religious tactics. Don't be like the don't be like the Pharisees who basically they have all these religious um, tactics and they love for people to see them praying thus and thou and it's eloquent. God's like, just come to me, throw all that mess down. Just come to me, you know, be straight up with me. Like I said, just like I'm talking to you all right here, right now, there is a time I do have a reverence and a respect and a a a reverential fear for God. And sometimes I'm in a place in a state of just complete worship where don't bother me. Don't touch me. It is all glory to him. And then sometimes I sit down with God. I'm like, God, listen, look, what's up? Let's talk. You know, I told you about the testimony with the house. I said, you know, God, look, listen, if you call me to full-time ministry, then guess what? You need to take care of me. You know, so it's a relationship. And so God is saying, just do that. Be that with me. So Matthew six and nine is what we just covered. And then let's go to Matthew 26 and 41. Matthew 26 and 41. Matthew 26 and 41. And what that says is watch and pray so that you will not fall into uh, temptation The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So this is Jesus talking to the disciples and he basically was telling them uh, what was going on here was Jesus was about to be, this was right before the crucifixion. This is where he was about to be taken and he was telling the disciples, you know, I need you to, I need you to watch and I need you to pray. I need you to be up praying for me and I need you to be praying about this. And, you know, basically he goes on, they they fall asleep on you, boy. And he kind of gets upset. He's like, y'all, what, y'all can watch and pray for one hour? 
One hour is all I ask you for. So that's why I say, you know, when you talk to Jesus, when you go to God, if you read the Bible, you see that Jesus has so much personality. One, one of my favorite areas is I talk to my sister about this all the time, how, you know, you'll hear WWJD, what would Jesus do? And as Christians, we are made to feel that, you know, yes, we are the example of Jesus Christ in the earth's realm. We absolutely are. And we are to show love. John three sixteen says, for God so loved the world that he gave. He submitted his only son that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He gave. So we are an example. And so that's why we are to submit because Jesus is our example of the ultimate sacrifice of, and of submission. And so we show love, which is how we draw. Love is drawing unconditional and committed love draws. I got that phrase when I went to, I went to St. Lucia last year and I went to go visit, um, church, my friend's, um, family's church and the the priest there he said something that just it stuck with me and he said unconditional and committed love it draws and that's what Jesus does unconditional and committed and that stood out with me because it's something I'm learning you know especially learning and walking out and learning to become a wife um unconditional and 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 committed are two things that you have to engrave in your brain because again I told you I'd be like um I ain't got to put up with this goodbye but um unconditional and committed says nope yes you do so but um we we're talking about he says why oh Jesus's personality Jesus has so much personality and one of the things that I like my sister and I we were talking about was when Jesus was in the temple and they had, you know, people were selling things. This was a temple of worship. It was a place of God. And they had, he said, you've made my father's house a den of thieves and robbers because they were selling things. They were basically pimping out, pimping out the place. They were using it. There was all kind of idols and worship and things going on, false idols. And Jesus came in there and it says, Jesus start whipping people and throwing over tables. I was like, yes. That is the scripture I want to be able to walk in because we, as believers, we feel like we're just supposed to be doormats and people can say anything to us and do whatever. And I'm not saying go out there, act up. That is not what I'm telling y'all. But Jesus has a personality. Jesus is not a doormat. He's not a floor mat. He is not a pushover. He is the man and he has so much personality. So what I was saying in that scripture is, you know, he basically chastised, you know, and he got smart with them also when, when they were um, in the boat, we talked about that when they were in the boat and the, he says, peace be still when he spoke to the storm. And he basically chastised him after that. It says, you know, how long y'all got to be with me before you get it? You know, Jesus got smart with them. <laughs> he, he basically clapped back at them quite a few times. And so he just has so much personality and you have to read the Bible and not see the Bible as just, oh, <sighs> Let me open this up and let me just read through this. And, you know, it, the Bible is real. It is alive and it is exciting and you have to see it. And it is not just characters. These are real people that walk the face of the earth. You are not reading a good story. This is history. All right. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So God says in your submitting you have to watch and you have to pray. What am I watching for, Takia? Well, number one, watch and make sure that you are always giving it to God. Make sure that you're always submitting to God. Make sure you're watchful and mindful that the enemy is not trying to sneak in there and confuse you and deceive you into thinking that you can handle this in and of yourself. That's what he means by that you will not fall into temptation. Because we learned again last night um, that... Like a roaring lion, the enemy seeks about whom he may devour. He says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Remember, our spirit never sleeps nor slumbers. When we submit to God and surrender, then we are giving it. We are allowing our spirit to take. And it says the spirit is willing. He's up. He's like, I got it. I'm good. I'm going to take care of this. If you've given it to me, I got you, girl. Give it to the spirit. Okay. Let's go to Luke 22:41. Luke 
Luke 22 and 41. And that says, he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed. This is Jesus in the garden. Of Geth I can never say the word, but that's the main. And this was before his time or right before his time had come. And he was praying to God. And again, this shows you that Jesus has so much personality and really is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. There is nothing on this earth that we have endured that Jesus has not felt. And so he knows all about it. And he was in such a place of actual distress because he was torn between his spirit saying, this is what you got to do. This is your hour. This is this is what you were sent here for. This is what you signed up for. This is what you submitted. Submitted. You said you would go for Takia. You would go for Arthenia. You would go for Leslie. You go for Cherry. This is where you said you would go. His spirit was like, let's do it. But Jesus in the form of man in the flesh, he was like, mm, I'm about to endure some stuff, some hurt, some pain, some deception, some physical punishment. This is tough, God. This is tough. And matter of fact, God is so tough that um, if you could take this cup from me, if I don't have to do it, if there is another way, then let's do it that way, God. Jesus was real. In the flesh, he didn't want to do this. He didn't want to submit. But his spirit, what he did, he said, it says he knelt down and prayed. He got down. He humbled himself. And he prayed. He talked to his father. And he let that spirit rise up and he put that flesh under submission. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Just so we can get to this moment right here. Submission, praying. He talked to God. He prayed to God. He prayed to God. And he allowed his spirit to lead and override his flesh. And he said, nevertheless, Lord, thine will, but mine. I mean, not my will, but thine. He says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. That's submission right there. Father, if you are willing, take this cup. That was Jesus's flesh trying to take the lead, his soul. But then his spirit said, yet not my will, but yours. He gave, he submitted, and he allowed the spirit. And we see what the outcome was. And we go back to what I talked about earlier is as a believer, we simply must learn to go through. If Jesus did not go through, where would we be today? He went through. He went through. We have to go through to get to where God needs us to be. Alrighty, and then Acts 13 and 3. Acts 13 and 3. Acts 13 and 3 says, So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. This is referring to the apostles. And basically what happened, or well, let's see. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. And I want you to circle pray, P-R-A-Y-E-D. And again, what we're talking about is the importance of, I just completely got away from this, didn't I? The importance of praying, prayer. Let's see. And pull my computer back up. Hey, Auntie B. All right. Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer. All right. And so what's going on here is the apostles, they had what they were trying to do is, if you recall, in, um, in, um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, 
depending on which account you read or where it's where you go by, we know that Judas basically hung himself and Judas was one of the disciples. And so after um, the ascension, um, there were 11 and basically the disciples had now become apostles and what they needed to do was they needed 12. Jesus had commanded and deemed 12. And so there, there was a vacancy. There was a job vacancy. There was an opening. And so basically what they needed to do was pray about who was going to step into this position. And so they basically, there were several that were chosen and they basically prayed about it so that Jesus would show them who was going to be the apostle to, to, to join them. And it says they fasted, they prayed and they laid hands. And so I'm trying to listen to Holy Spirit to give me a little more on why he gave me this one. Um, it was the last one he gave me, but I'm trying to see why specifically he gave me that one. If it's on fasting, Lord. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. It's just an example of prayer. They have fasted and prayed. The importance of prayer. Um, let's point out, here's something I do want to point out. So, so those were the what, five? One, two, three, four, five five scriptures that God gave me on prayer because on worksheet eight, we are covering how submitting. So, okay. So the apostles, they all had to submit to God in prayer and for to get the answer that they needed from God. And so we're talking about submitting in the three ways in Philippians four and six that we can submit is by prayer, by petition and with Thanksgiving. And so we just chopped away at prayer tonight and so it's interesting because I wanted to find out, we, let me back up and say this again. When we talk about words in the Bible and things in the Bible, I said this, that everything is in there for a reason. Everything is in there for a purpose. It's not just written in there just to skim over or just as a space filler. Everything is in there for a reason. And so when we're talking about prayer and talking about the importance of prayer, the fact that it means to talk to God, to have a relationship, to build a rapport with God. You talk, he listens, you sit in the silence and listen to him. And one of the ways, again, a lot of times people will say, well, I don't know how to hear from God. How do you hear from God? And I said, if you're not hearing from him, start right here. Start in his word. Start in his word. 66 books. He will speak to you through his word. You can get clarity and direction and understanding there. And so I looked at the word pray since we are talking about pray tonight and how important it is. And what we did was those were scriptures that God gave me where Jesus prayed, the disciples prayed, the apostles prayed. If those were, if Jesus himself, when we go back to the garden in, in Luke 22, if Jesus, our example, the one that we surrender and submit to prays and talks to God, his father, then we are to follow that example. We are not exempt from it. And so the word pray in the Bible, 121 times, these are some fun facts for you, 121 times. And then that doesn't include the different variations of the word pray. Prayed, P-R-A-Y-E-D, is mentioned 68 times in the Bible. Prayer. P-R-A-Y-E-R -E is mentioned 106 times. Prayers, plural with an S, P-R-A-Y-E-R-S, 32 times. Praying, P-R-A-Y-I-N-G, present, 36 times. And then praise, P-R-A-Y-S, 12 times for a total of 375 times that pray or the variation of pray is mentioned in the Bible 375 times. So when I saw that we have 365 days in a year. So even if you just broke it up 375 plus an extra 10, we should be praying every single day and talking to God throughout the day. And just that is step that is one facet of this tactic of submission on how we are to submit to God is we are to 
pray and talk to him and give him, give over everything, every one of our thoughts, our actions, our needs, um, before we think it, before we speak it, before we do it, let's pray and let's talk to God about it. And so that is all I have on that tonight. What I want you to do, if you did not work on it last night, all I want you to do tonight is write it out or last night, whether you did it, pray without ceasing. Absolutely. Pray without ceasing. And, and, and let me dig deeper into that a little bit, because I remember when I would hear that pray without ceasing, without ceasing means to not stop. And it's like, well, do you just walk around all day, just praying, praying, praying? Um, I don't think it's humanly possible just because we have to interact and do things, but it does mean throughout your day just to talk to God. So earlier, as I was walking around, I was just doing stuff. Um, I got up this morning. When I wake up, I talk to God. When I get up, you know, I get my day started and then I have my devotional time and that's my, and and that's my devoted time. If anyone's wondering what devotional that is my, so if we're talking to God throughout the day, just in our comings and our goings, but then you should have a time that you do have complete devoted time to him. And that's what devotional means. This devotional growth is teaching us. Let's give him a devoted time. Yes, we talk to him throughout the day. We hear him throughout the day. We see him. We feel him. We know him throughout the day, but he should have a time of devotion. When we go back to, I'm going to keep paralleling relationships. When you are in a relationship with your spouse, you know, your husband or any kind of relationship, you don't grow in a relationship unless you spend time with that person. You don't get to know them more unless you spend time with them. You don't get to understand them unless you spend time and you're around them. It's no different with God. He knows you. He knows everything about you. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. That's what God says. But he's like, now I want you to come know me. And so we should have a devoted time where we sit down, where we are devout and devoted to him and sit down and talk to him and pray or read or study the word or worship or sing or whatever that looks like for you. It just should be a time of devotion to God. And so when we talk about pray without ceasing, just throughout our day. So I was one thing that stood out me in particular was um, this I have on this dress. You can't see it, but I have on this dress today. I wanted to get up. And I was going to, we have horses out back and I was like, I'm going to go and spend some time with the horses. They are not liking me right now because I don't spend a whole lot of time with them. My son feeds them two times a day and they love him. They adore him because he comes bearing gifts. He has food. And then I come bopping out there, you know, once in a while and they just kind of look at me like, oh, here she come. What she want? And so I said, I was going to go spend time with the horses. So in going out there, I wanted to put on, hey D, I wanted to put on, um, you know, some jeans and some knee boots, some riding boots and just dress to be out there messing around with horses. And as I was getting my day started, God started talking to me and he said, nope, wear that. And it's like a floor length dress. Mm, This is not what I want to go out there and deal with horses with. And we just kind of went back and I said, are you sure, God? And he said, yeah, wear that. So God and I, we talked and I didn't go. I mean, I went out there and I pet him, but I didn't get all involved with them for whatever reason. He didn't want me to. And um, but I didn't go get involved with them. And basically, that's how you talk to God just throughout your day. You know, talk to him about what you're going to wear. Talk to him about what you're going to do. Talk to him about what you're going to eat. And I remember going back and forth with him because I was like, really? This is what you want me to wear? Yeah, wear that. And then we started having this other conversation about <clears throat> an individual. And I remember God saying something to me. And I was like, you know what, God? I love that we talk like this. I love that I'm hearing you like this. And I will share with you ladies, this journey, this right here, talking to you all and God using me in this capacity, it is doing nothing but help me to hear God's voice clearer and clearer. And I love it. And I'm so grateful and thankful for it and for you all. There used to be a place and a space not too long ago that the enemy, I allowed the enemy to convince me that I was spiraling and that I was crazy because of the way that I hear God. 
that I literally was mentally not okay and I would be afraid to speak up and tell people that God said or I hear from God or that he gives me visions or dreams or that he shows me things. I literally allowed the enemy to convince me that I was crazy. And that is what he had to do. He was like, you're crazy. He was trying to block. And so when I'd hear things from God, I would be like, no, no, Takiya. No, I literally would like shake my head. That's not God. You are not hearing from God. Nobody hears from God like that. Just stop, stop. And I tried to shut the voices out. That sounds crazy. I tried to shut the voices out, but it was God. It was God's voice. And see, that's how the enemy had me thinking that you're just crazy. You, you, you probably, you know, are about to suffer from some mental illness where, you know, you know, you hear things. And I went a year of trying to block God's voice because the enemy said, you are not hearing from God. You that's no, nobody hears from God like that. And I have just, thank God, gotten to a place that I know that I'm hearing my daddy's voice and I'm not ashamed of it. And I am not afraid of it. And I will continue to walk boldly in it. And I will just continue to forever be his servant, you know? So it's just exciting to me when I hear God tell me like, you know, no, wear this dress. And I don't even without a hesitation respond back and go, really? What? That's what you, that used to feel crazy. Like this lady is standing in a room by herself talking back and forth with something or someone that we can't see about what she should wear. Yes, it is God talking to me. And I am so grateful for it. And I'm so excited about it. And I am just on this journey Yes, thank God that I finally surrendered to the call because I was running. Let, let me tell you, I was Jonah. <laughs> I was Jonah. God said go to Nineveh and I was like, uh, yeah, no. Mm -mm. <laughs> but um, I was. I have been running from this calling and I have been, um, you know, I even have people that, you know, in my life, um, God had to remove me from certain things in certain places because it was detrimental and damaging to my ability to hear God's voice because I was allowing their voice voice to be I trusted the God in them and what they said and God was telling me hey guess what you hear me for yourself and I have called you to be separate and come out from among them and I have to do that is one thing I do know when God tells me to do something I'm like yeah you know what I'm gonna listen I know when I know when I know when I know that God is telling me something and um I'm just not gonna be afraid of that and so that is all I have tonight ladies I see my Midwest family joined I know y'all are like an hour behind I know you can catch me in the replay it's always so exciting to see you all log on um but my Midwest family, you all can catch it in the replay because you see I'm wrapping up. But that's all I have for tonight. Tomorrow is worksheet number nine. And it's the same thing as this. You're just going to notice that the next word that is in bold is petition. And let me do a quick synopsis of it. <sighs> worksheet number nine. Still Philippians 4 and 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition is what we're going to focus on in our devotional between tonight and tomorrow. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. Philippians 4 and 6. Excuse me. Petition means to write a signed formal request appealing my desires to the proper authority. I will craft and sign a letter to God in which I appeal to my submission to his authority, therefore requiring him to take on all that I give to him, in turn giving him total responsibility to take care of my needs, wants, and desires. So let's talk about petition real quick just a little bit. And then if you look down at the bottom of that, I actually put a line for you to sign and date. So what you're going to do is you wrote your prayers out between last night and tomorrow. You wrote out what you want to pray about. I put my children, my family, comings and goings, finances, relationships, business, friendships, associations, health, surroundings, the world, souls. Those are just some of the things that I put that I 
continuously need to learn or have God help me to submit just to give to him because I can't do it. And so you did or you're doing the same thing on worksheet number eight, but then in moving forward on worksheet nine, now it says we're going to craft a letter to God. So when we talk about petition, so I used to work in the legal field like 20 years ago when my daughter was little and I worked as a legal assistant and um, we did a lot of legal documents and there was legal terms and petition. When you hear the word petition, you usually think of a petition that you sign. Oh, I'm signing a petition, you know, to get this person out of office or I'm signing a petition for our community to have this. It is a legal form. It comes, it's a derived from legal source and a petition is something that you either write up or you sign. And in this instance, it is to, or you write up and it is signed. It's talking about petitioning God. So he said, what are your prayers? Lay your prayers out to me. Tell me what your prayers are. Okay, now petition me. Write it out. Write it out and give it to me. Sign and date it. Because when you sign and date it, you are now entering into a contract. And God is a God of covenant. God is a God of contract. He must uphold his word. And so you are going to write out. And I say craft. I use the word craft because I want C-R-A-F-T piece put together, be crafty. I want you to take your time and think about this because it says you're going to petition God. So if you are writing a letter to God about your prayers, what would you say to him? How would you say it? What would that look like? What would that sound like? You are petitioning him. And so I'm going to give you a hint. And it does not have to for those that are newer in the faith. Again, I said you have digital study Bibles. You have U version. If you don't know where I still use it, I still st- I, I, I there's a lot of word that's in me that flows out. But I have to go and search and go, well, God, where is that? Because it's just in me. Um, so digital Bibles or however you study to find it, then you do that. But I'm going to tell you one key thing with God as far as um, when you are petitioning him, when you write this out. In court, it's good to have evidence. So when you write your petition out to God, you get that scripture as your evidence. God, I don't know if I can do that. No, God, I can do all things through Christ who is my strength. So you, whatever you write out, you write scripture, you find scripture to add as a part of your petition. God, you said, Right now, Father God, I am believing that you are going to cover and keep me and my family during this time of uncertainty because in your word, Father God, you said, I have never seen the righteous forsaken nor my seed beg bread. See how I back that up with scripture? You put scripture in there. You are petitioning him because we are crafting something that we are taking to the authority. So this is like we're going to court and we are going, we're going to the high courts. We are going to heavenly courts and the authority, our judge, our king, our father is God. And we're going to petition him and we are going to present legal contracts to him and we are going to give him evidence with his word. So that is what I want you to do. I want you to craft that. And I want you to sign and date it. And I want you to take this serious because God is watching and he he is going to perform it. He says he looks over his word to perform it. Give him his word back to him. Remember, I said, that's how I talk to God. God, you said, I give him his word back. You said, you said in your word and you said you would do this and you said, so let's craft that petition to God based upon the prayers that we put together. Okay. I am going to close out. You cannot come to court without evidence and if you should do so oh man it is not a good thing absolutely not that's what leslie says you don't go to court without evidence you show up to court without evidence you just fumbling bumbling over yourself and you hanging on wishing on a prayer hoping praying for god please to show up and help me well we go into the court the authority show up with evidence show up with evidence um so that's all i have tonight I am going to, <laughs> okay, auntie, you got me over here giggling. You got me blushing. <laughs> um, I'm just, let me see if God, just wait and see if there's something else God had me to say to you ladies tonight. Um, I will say this and I'll close out with this in prayer. One of the things I watched um, a video today, I posted it on my page of a nurse that was, she just put a, um, she just really showed what she or not showed. She talked about what she sees with um, being a nurse and being in the industry. Thank you, Miss Leslie, Mama Leslie. And uh, she 
just talked about what she sees and uh, you know I haven't been watching any of the videos I've been guarding my heart and guarding my mind and um what my battery time out is low again 10% we good well remember we talked about that 10% last night iPhone sneaky so I got like two seconds um just just be in prayer I know you already are in prayer but it just really touched me just to be in prayer for everything that is going on and there's so many people being impacted so as i close out i always offer jesus christ as lord and savior if you don't know jesus as your lord and savior now is the absolute time to get to know him he would love to know you he would love to take care of your needs your wants desires he would love to put your mind at ease and rest and for you to rest in him because he says he is the complete and total peace so Romans 10 9 tells us that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, then we're saved. It's as simple as that. So as I pray, I want you to confess that. Repeat it after me. Father God, in Jesus name, you said in your word that if I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that you died and rose for me, I will be saved. Lord, I believe you are my savior Come into my life, come into my heart, heal me, make me whole. I ask your forgiveness of my sins and I thank you for saving me. Now, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, as any soul has confessed, as any mouth has spoken, Lord, we just thank you and give you reverence and glory. Lord, we thank you right now for the word that has come forth and that has been taught and that has been sown into each and every individual's heart. Lord, I just thank you for the power, your the, the intricate workings of your power, Lord God, the intricate workings, Lord God, of your spirit, Lord God, I thank you for everything that you Thank you, Father, for everything that you are doing. Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus, I just lift up, Lord God, we come into agreement. I ask my prayer warriors just to pray in the spirit. Lord God, we come into agreement right now for all those, Lord God, that are impacted by COVID. Lord, any and everyone, Lord God, we just ask right now that as we stand in agreement and we release your healing power and your virtue to go out, Lord God, in this earth's realm, that you continue, Lord God, to Pull together every prayer of the righteous. For you said the effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much, Lord God. You said if your people who are called by your name, Lord God, will humble ourselves, turn from our wicked ways, seek your face and pray, then would you heal this land. You said in the name of Jesus that you sent your word to heal us, Lord God. So we thank you, Lord God, that as we speak the word, it is going out. We thank you that you are touching lives and healing them, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that you are strengthening and sustaining all the workers out there, Lord God. We lift up, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Jesus, all those that are called to be an authority and, and, and leadership in this nation, Lord God, that you would send labors into their vineyard, Lord God, that they, Lord God, would be strengthened, Lord God, that they would be given godly wisdom and instruction, Father God. In the name of Jesus, Lord God, we speak against, Lord God, the spirit of sickness. We speak against the spirit of COVID-19. We speak against the spirit of plague and famine in the land, Lord God, and we loose and we release, Lord God, your angel of war, Lord God, to go out before us, Lord God, just as the children of Israel, Lord God, had the cloud by day and the pillar of smoke by night continue to lead your people as we walk this thing out lord god and recognize lord god that your hand is with us lord god that your hand is yet upon us lord god father i thank you again for strength lord god i thank you again for the blood of jesus lord god and i thank you lord god that in the name of jesus as you said in psalm 91 that no plague and no terror shall come not at our homes i plead the blood of jesus over everyone watching lord i plead the blood of jesus over the family over the friends lord god i plead the blood of jesus lord God over this nation and over this world Lord God and we continue to rest in you Father God we continue to trust in you for our eyes are on God you said in the name of Jesus to trust in you with our whole heart and to lean out with our own understanding Lord God walk with us talk with us continue to heal strengthen and deliver us in Jesus name I pray amen all right ladies that is it I am going to go ahead and um I got my boys in the other room. They're playing video games. And uh, I think I'm going to go crash it and play video games. They hate when I come play um, games because I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to play. I lose all their men. I crash their cars. And then they lose their points. And then, I don't know, something. They just, they don't like me to play. So I'm going to go do that. <laughs> so, all right. I love everyone. And I will see you again here. We are going to be doing week two, day five. This is just flowing and going. It's amazing. Tomorrow, 7 o'clock. Eastern Standard Time. I love you all. Have a blessed night. Mwah.